Psalm 81. Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout joyfully to the God of Jacob. Raise a song, strike the timbrel, the sweet-sounding lyre with the harp. Blow the trumpet at the new moon, at the full moon on our feast day. For it is a statute for Israel, an ordinance of the God of Jacob. He established it for a testimony in Joseph when he went, through the land, went throughout the land of Egypt. I heard a language that I did not know. I relieved his shoulder from the burden. His hands were freed from the basket. You called in trouble, and I rescued you. I answered you in the hiding place of thunder. I proved you at the waters of Meribah. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you would listen to me, let there be no strange God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I, the Lord, am your God who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But... My people did not listen to my voice, and Israel did not obey me. So I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart to walk in their own devices. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. Those who hate the Lord would pretend obedience to him, and their time of punishment would be forever. But I would feed you with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. You know, it's an interesting thing to watch God be frustrated. You know, you, you think of all of these sovereign characteristics of God, and that seems to give us the picture that he's never um, sitting back shaking his head, that he's never just looking at us going, why? You know, and he, and he asks that not because he doesn't know the answer, but because that's the emotion that he feels. It's like, are you serious? That's your decision? Everything I've given you, everything I've taught you, and that's what you're going to do with it? Starts to make sense why we call him father, right? That's a very parental feeling when our kids are acting foolishly. So, I will tell you something about the structure of this text, and then we'll see the gospel in it. The structure of this text, to me, is a little funny because it doesn't make any sense until, you know, get us there. But it doesn't make any sense. Look at this. It starts with, shout for joy. You know, let, let's, ha let's have a party. We're going to blow a trumpet at the, the New Moon Festival. This is great. We're going to keep the feasts of God. This is awesome. What else is awesome? Well, God starts talking and he says, you know, I, I came, delivered them out of the land of Egypt. I heard a language that I did not know. In other words, you know, these Egyptians, they're not my people. I ain't listening to them. I relieved his shoulder, you know, Jacob, Israel, I relieved his shoulder of the burden. His hands were freed from the basket. You called in the day of trouble and I rescued you. This is all great stuff. But then, then he shifts and he says, Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. Israel, if you would listen to me. Right? And they don't. So there's all this stuff to celebrate and rejoice over. And then there's these reasons that none of that rejoicing applies to them. Why would you put both of those in the same song? What's going on here? You read through Psalm 81 and it's like structurally... This thing doesn't make any sense. Well, there are ways to make sense of it, you know, in the flow of poetry and so on, you know, like uh, literarily. But I would suggest to you that the only way that this actually makes sense is if the gospel is true. And here's what I mean. When you look at the end of it, he says, verse 13, Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Okay, so he says, look, just obey me. Listen to me and do what I say. You know, what would the benefits of that be? He says, I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. Those who hate the Lord would pretend obedience to him and their time of punishment would be forever. But I would feed you with the finest wheat and with honey from the rock I would satisfy you. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like a poetic rendering of New Testament Christianity where God fights for us and as we go to battle in prayer and we take up the armor of God every element of the armor of God ends up tying directly back to Christ and he winds up being the one who fights for us and and defends and protects us everything that we have we have from God think about all the promises from Matthew 7 that Jesus gives us right he's like look you're gonna have what you need God will give you what you need are you not more valuable than a flower a flower has never starved to death okay you're gonna be fine God will take care of you he says that there will be those who pretend obedience to the Lord. Yeah, I mean, anybody ever walked into a church? Anybody ever seen a fake Christian? They're scattered around. 
thankfully not most people in the churches. Well, not our church anyway. I think we got some real solid disciples here, but some people fake it. There is such a thing as a Judas, right? We're in the time when this is happening. And he says their time of punishment will be forever, which is exactly what Peter says about Judas in Acts chapter 1. So if we can be perfectly obedient to God, and if we can listen to him all the time, without exception, and we can walk in his statutes, never mistaking, never making a mistake, and never sinning or deviating, then we would get something that looks like New Testament Christianity. Hmm. Well, you guys know where I'm going with this. There's a problem here. We have not done that. We have not perfectly listened to God. We have not perfectly walked in his statutes. So all this joy that it's talking about up at the, at the beginning, you know, sing for joy to God our strength. Shout joyfully to the God of Jacob. We shouldn't expect any of that because we haven't fulfilled the requirements, right? We haven't done what God commands in order to partake in his joy and in his fullness. So why do we get to partake in the joy of the Lord? That's right, grace and truth, because Jesus did it for us, right? He listened to his father. He said, I only do the things that my father commands me to do. He says, I am, my, my, my bread is to do the will of him who sent me. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's in Deuteronomy, but Jesus quoted that when he was fulfilling Israel's mission in the desert, which Israel failed, right? Being tempted by the devil, and he withstood it. So he perfectly listened to God. And he perfectly obeyed God. His bread was the word of God and his bread was the obedience to God. And so since he has fulfilled this as our representative on our behalf, what are we left with? We are left with verses one through four, right? Sing for joy to God our strength. Shout joyfully to the God of Jacob. I mean, you ever sang a song to God in celebration? That celebration, that joy was purchased for us by Jesus swapping places with us and taking the punishment away. He fulfilled the requirement. He got treated as though he failed the requirement and he took our punishment away as our representative. Now we get the benefits of having fulfilled the requirement. We get the blessing that Jesus earned, not the punishment that we earned. Gospel! That's Psalm 81.